Zong Museums of South Africa is an amalgamation of eight museums, seven of which are in Swane and one in Johannesburg. Our museums have a diverse collection covering the fields of fauna and flora, paleontology, military and cultural history, geology, anthropology and archaeology. We have offerings that cater for both local and international tourists, young people, adults, students and researchers. For more, visit ditzong.org.za and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest and Facebook. The Pretoria Art Museum building is a low slung glass and concrete edifice and a fine example of the international style. The Art Museum was inaugurated on 20 May 1964, as the other South African art museums had already assembled examples of European art, it was decided to concentrate on establishing a representative collection of South African art. The Art Museum acquires the finest examples of mainly South African art and conserves the permanent collection according to international museological standards. The collection consists of the Lady Michaela's bequest, which includes mainly North Dutch and Flemish paintings of the 17th century. All South African masters, as well as contemporary developments in South African art, including urban, rural, and traditional art and new media. Also, techniques in order to reflect the historical diversity of art in South Africa, thus reflecting all genres, art mediums, art movements, influences and leading figures, supplemented by traditional South African craftwork. The Art Museum hosts exhibitions showcasing the best of South African art from the permanent collection, Korobrik Ceramic Collection. A selection of ceramics that represent the development of studio ceramics and the work of traditional rural potters in South Africa over the past 30 years is on display. In 1982, Korobrik became the sponsor and acquired the collection. Since then, numerous acquisitions have been added to the collection. Mayak Bradel, The New York Years, 1981-2003 to 2003. When Mayak Bradel immigrated to New York in 1981, with her husband and two young children, she embarked on a journey that would lead her from the confines of a traditional marriage to the riches that this world city had to offer the searching artist. The Association of Arts Pretoria, in conjunction with the Pretoria Art Museum, presents extensive retrospective exhibition that is curated by Professor Alfreda Dreyer. The works on show cover a period of 22 years that follows the trajectory of the artist's initial confrontations with issues of belonging and disbelonging as the chasm between her mother's country and her adopted home was mediated through both images and poetry. Other South African contingents, including five batteries of the South African Heavy Artillery, the South African Medical Corps, the South African Signal Company and the Railways and Trades Companies also saw service in the Western Front. South African troops also served in Palestine in the course of the campaign against Turkey. A brigade of field artillery was deployed there in the summer of 1916, together with the 1st Battalion Cape Corps, both of which were transferred from East Africa. The 1st Battalion Cape Corps distinguished itself at the Battle of Square Hill in September 1918. Within two decades, the Second World War broke out in September 1939. Once again, with the same political divisions as that of 1914, South Africa entered the fray on the side of the Allies. In February 1940, 
the active citizen force was reorganized on a completely voluntary basis due to the vociferous South African opposition to the country's entry into the war. Those who took the Africa Service Oath in March 1940 committed themselves to serve anywhere on the African continent and wore an orange shoulder flash. South Africa played a significant role in the struggle against the German-Italian Axis in Africa. The first South African division was instrumental in driving Italy from its East African colonies of Abyssinia and Somaliland with relatively few casualties of 270 men, of whom 73 were killed. In one major aspect, the Abyssinian campaign had been a misleading initiation into battle for the South African forces. The campaign was rapid, of only five months' duration, with victories achieved against a largely irresolute and dispirited enemy. In an unbroken series of defeats, the Italians lost 30 generals, 170,000 troops, 42 tanks and 103 guns, inflicted by an enemy who were outnumbered 3 to 1. In North Africa, where the 1st Division was joined by the 2nd South African Division, the South Africans forming part of the British Eighth Army found themselves up against a highly efficient and resolute enemy in the Axis forces, led by General, later Field Marshal, Erwin Rommel. The 1st Division was committed to Operation Crusader in which the Eighth Army endeavoured to relieve the beleaguered garrison at Tobruk. In the course of the offensive, the 5th South African Brigade was overrun by German armour on the 23rd of November 1941 at Sidi Rizeg. Less than half the brigade survived. The 2nd Division, having prepared defensive positions at El Alamein, moved to the Egyptian-Libyan frontier and in December 1941, January 1942, forced the Axis forces at Badia, Solim and Halfaya to surrender. Both divisions then moved to Ghazala, a defensive line immediately west of Tobruk. The 1st Division, under the command of Major General Dan Pinar, held the coastal sector, while the 2nd Division, under Major General H.B. Klopper, took up positions in Tobruk itself. By mid-June 1942, the Axis forces broke through the Ghazala line and forced the 8th Army to withdraw to Egypt. The 2nd Division was surrounded at Tobruk and as a result lost 10,722 men as prisoners of war to the Axis. The 1st Division withdrew to the Alamein Line, where it played a leading role in the two battles of El Alamein which followed. The first battle commenced on the 1st of July 1942, when the might of the German armour was hurled at the El Alamein defences. The defence held and the Axis forces withdrew. The second battle commenced on the 23rd of October 1942, when the 8th Army launched a major offensive against the Axis forces. This battle, considered to be a turning point in the Allied fortunes during the war, resulted in the repulse of the Axis forces from Egypt and Libya. Fighter and bomber squadrons of the South African Air Force, as part of the Desert Air Force, played a critical role in achieving air superiority and victory in Africa. The ships of the South African Naval Forces patrolling the Cape Sea route and the Mediterranean were equally vital in the achievement of naval superiority over the enemy. South African non-divisional troops, such as the South African Engineer Corps and Tank Corps, were also vital to the Allied victory in Africa, and continued serving in the North African theatre until Axis resistance collapsed there in April 1943. Between June and November 1942, the 7th South African Brigade under the command of Brigadier G. T. Seneschal took part in the British invasion of Madagascar then under the control of Vichy France, and facing the threat of capture by the Japanese who had penetrated the Indian Ocean. The Vichy forces surrendered on the 2nd of March 1942, following the penetration of the southern half of the island. South African casualties numbered only 18, the result of tropical diseases. In January 1943, a new oath, the General Service Oath, was introduced to enable those who wished to volunteer for service anywhere in the world. The 6th South African Armoured Division was formed under the command of Major General W. H. E. Poole for service in German-occupied Italy. 
In April 1944, the division landed in Italy and initially, under the command of the British Eighth Army, became involved in the fierce Battle of Monte Cassino. After the fall of Rome in June 1944, the South Africans spearheaded the Allied advance northwards as the Germans staged a fighting withdrawal to prepare defensive lines in the rear. Eventually, in August 1944, the 6th Division entered Florence in the vanguard of the Allied advance. In September 1944, the division came under the command of the United States Fifth Army and became heavily involved in breaking the Gothic line beyond Florence. The slow advance involved fighting many ferocious battles against a determined and stubborn enemy. The South Africans continued fighting in the Po Valley and ended its campaign near the town of Finale. Throughout the campaign, the Germans demolished and blocked tunnels, roads, mountain passes and bridges with the highest degree of expertise, and the role of the South African Engineer Corps became indispensable to the Allied progress. The South African Air Force squadrons played a dominant role in the maintenance of Allied air support. Number two South African Air Force Wing, operating from Italy, played an important role in the hazardous supply drop to the beleaguered Polish forces in the Warsaw Uprising in August 1944. The end of the Second World War witnessed the beginning of the Cold War, with the imposition of the Iron Curtain across Europe by the Soviet Union. In 1948, the Soviet Union initiated a strategic attempt to expel the Western powers from West Berlin by cutting the overland communication between West Berlin and West Germany, thus requiring all supplies to be airlifted into the city. The South African Air Force was called upon to contribute to the year-long Anglo-American airlift to West Berlin by providing 20 air crews for a daily shuttle service which flew no less than 1,000 240 missions in Royal Air Force Dakotas out of the German city of Lübeck during the airlift. In June 1950, South Korea was invaded by Communist North Korea and the United Nations requested its member states to intervene militarily in support of the South Koreans. South Africa readily offered the services of No. 2 Squadron South African Air Force, which was gratefully accepted. The squadron, equipped with F-51 Mustangs and later by F-86 Sabres, was mainly involved in ground strike operations. By the end of hostilities in 1953, the squadron had flown 12,405 sorties. The squadron's members were awarded the prestigious unit citation from the President of the United States of America. South Africans who gave their lives in the First World War lie in cemeteries throughout Africa, the Middle East and Europe. The names of the missing on the Western Front are inscribed on the monument to the missing of the Somme at Tiepval and on the Menin Gate at Ypres. Although South Africans had fought in many battles on several other fronts, Delverwood was chosen as the official national memorial site because of the huge impact that the battle had had on the consciousness of the South African people. South African dead of the Second World War lie predominantly in the war cemeteries at Akroma, Tobruk, El Alamein, Castiglione, Florence and Balsina. South African Air Force men who died in the raid on Warsaw are buried in the Krakow, Rakovici and Belgrade war cemeteries. The names of the missing are inscribed on the Alamein and Malta memorials. Shortly before the Anglo-Bur War, from 1899 to 1902, the government of the South African Republic decided to fortify Pretoria in order to protect it. Four forts were built around the city, and, and Fort Klapperkop was the third fort erected before the outbreak of the Anglo-Bur War. The Jameson Raid that took place over the Old and New Year of 1895 and 1896 was the most important reason for the fortification of Pretoria. As was the case with the other forts, a paraffin engine generated power at Fort Klapperkop and lightning conductors were erected. A heliograph and overhead telegraph equipment were installed. The fort also had a telephone, 
a water reservoir which received water from the Fountains Valley was built under the provisions room. Fort Club Group has been restored historically correct and arranged as a museum with permanent exhibitions of anglo boer War objects and furniture. Apart from the museum, the fort also houses a stable complex, an old steam locomotive that was used during the war, the last tram used in Pretoria, the Dalwood tree and a commemorative South African Defence Force monument. Being the highest natural point in the city with 360 degrees views of Tswane, it is the ideal place for picnic, buy, event and meeting areas that are available on the site. Various pieces of heavy artillery were placed in the fort as armament, but not one of the forts was ever fully armoured. The well-known 150mm Cruzon cannon, better known as the Long Tong, was purchased specifically for the forts, and although at a certain stage every fort was armed with a Long Tong, these cannons were withdrawn in the course of time to be, be used as field guns at Falcons, Ladysmith, Mafeking and Bergendal. The shooting range of the Long Tong was 9,880 meters. A long term replica stands at Fort Klapperkop. Welcome to Melrose House Museum. In 1885, prosperous Pretoria businessman George Jesse Hayes purchased two Arfin in what is currently Jeff Masimola Street. He built Melrose House there in 1886, named after the famous Melrose Abbey in Scotland. Mr. Hayes married Emma Jane Harris and they had three daughters, Bill, Mabel and Jessie. Melrose House Museum is known for two things. The eclectic design style of the manor, a mix between Victorian Edwardian and Cape Dutch style, as well as the signing of the Peace Treaty of Vereniging. On the 5th of June 1900, during the Second Anglo-Boer War, also known as the South African War, British troops under the command of Lord Roberts invaded Pretoria. Lord Roberts requisitioned Melrose House as headquarters for the British forces. For more than 18 months, Instructions were issued from there, determining the strategy of the British forces in the field. The Peace Treaty of Vereniging, which ended the Second Anglo-Boer War, was signed on the 31st of May 1902 in the dining room of Melrose House by Lord Kitchener and Lord Milner for the British government and 10 representatives of the two Boer War republics. This nostalgic ambience is still felt in the dining room. Entering Melrose House Museum, you will be surrounded with Art Nouveau decor, themed hand-painted glass windows and Victorian furniture. Passing through the front door, the morning room on your left was also the war room during the English occupation of the Second Anglo-Boer War. It is during the time of the British occupation that Lord Kitchener executed the scorched earth policy. Past the ladies' parlour, the study of Mr. Hayes is seen. Although his main office was located in the Tudor building, still visible on Church Square today. The dining room is the true gem of Melrose House Museum, with the original furniture, carpet and wallpaper. One scene, you can only imagine the historical events that took place in this room. Down the corridor, the kitchen can be viewed on your left with a majestic display of dinnerware in the pantry. The billiards room with dramatic gothic glass windows is followed by the conservatory. Upstairs, there are four bedrooms. The main bedroom exhibits Victorian clothes and a copper and mother of pearl bed. The dressing room next door, initially a walk-in closet, was the perfect spot for Mrs. Hayes to take her morning tea. The rest of the bedrooms are the daughter's bedrooms. 
and displays the inner workings of young, young Victorian women. The third bedroom is converted into a nursery for museum display purposes, with two fabulous Victorian bathrooms, the one housing a shower bath and the other a sauna, shows the peer opulence and decadence of high society Victorians. Melrose House Museum is one of Twani's hidden gems, with a clear look at the past, creating nostalgia of the good and bad times gone by.